Well, hello everyone. I think uh, we can we can start already. Like it's a full room, uh, so thank you everyone for coming and uh, thanks to the organization for having me here. I'm pretty proud to be here talking about Cat's Effect. So, can you raise your hand if you know Cat's Effect? Ready, please. And how many of you are using Cat's Effect in production? All right. So now, hopefully, after this talk, like you get encouraged to. <laughs> to go and uh, just like deploy it to production without fear, refactor your code. Uh, and these cute pics are from this guy that's called Impure Pics on Twitter, and he's here in the audience today, so I'd like big shout out to him for this amazing, uh, amazing graphics. So I'm gonna start introducing myself. My name is Gabriel. I work for Payd in Tokyo, Japan, so I flew all the way to France to be here today, still very shot lagged. Uh, I'm a co-organizer of the Scala Tokyo Meetup, and I'm on Twitter, uh, so feel free to follow. I only, uh, I only use it just for nerding purposes, Scala, Haskell stuff. And uh, I put it on the slides because I'm really new to Twitter. I started using it early this year. <laughs> so, um, but I'm very active in the, in the open source community. I maintain a couple of projects, uh, FS2 related and Cats Effect and HTTP for us, and I try to contribute as much as I can. Uh, to the libraries that we use on a daily basis. Um, so the agenda for today uh, is going to consist of three different parts. The first two is like talking about the basics. What do you need to know before uh, talking about parallelism or concurrency or sort of like more difficult topics, like the base of what functional programming is? Then the last two, the, the next two things going to be focused more on real examples and like showing how we can compose different programs and how can we refactor them in order to compose them like small programs into bigger programs and we can test the application. And finally, uh, if we have the time, I would like to talk to you about the technical challenges we faced at uh, Payd, the current company we work for, <coughs> and how Cuts Effect and the ecosystem helped us solve these kind of nice challenges uh, in, a, in a very nice, nice way. So let's get started. What are effects? Uh, there, there was a nice talk this morning as well, like they mentioned uh, effects, side effects, and, and the IO monad. But sometimes people don't, don't really know this simple question, don't know how to, how to answer this question. What are effects? So an effect could be, uh, I'm pretty sure you know this one, you know option, right, in Scala. So option is an effect that may or may not produce a value of type A. That's an effect. Either is another effect that can either produce a value of type A or of type B. List can produce uh, zero, one, or many elements of type A. And cuts effect IO uh, that produces a value of type A fails or it never terminates. So these are effects. We can reason about effects. We can create effects and assign that uh, to a variable to be a, a value. And then on the other hand, we have side effects. For example, print a line uh, to the console, read the line from the console, uh, asking for the <coughs> for the current time from the JVM, or using future, <laughs> wrapping a side effect in future that also a side effect, um, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about that later. Uh, and I got Im inspired by like talking about this and you know trying to emphasize these topics uh, because of the the talk given by Rob Norris last year at Scale by the Bay. So I think we should talk more about this and uh, make the difference, you know, know how to distinguish between effects and side effects. And why is this so important? And I think, like, distinguishing between effects and side effects are important because we can then talk about referential transparency. Referential transparency, in my opinion, is the key to being doing functional programming in any language. So let's look at this example here. Uh, we have a, 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 an expression bound to a value one to three, and then we cr create the tuple of this, this expression. And we have two different programs. So how can we tell whether these two programs are the same or not? And, and there is a very simple thing that I'm pretty sure everybody here knows and that we learn probably in a math class in high school or in primary school. It's just called substitution. How can we tell whether these programs are the same? Well, we substitute, whenever we see this expression, we just substitute by using the value one, two, three, one, two, three. And then we compare, are these, is, is the, the meaning of the program still the same? And in this case, yes. So we can tell this is referential transparent. Uh, we are doing 
and this is a pure value, so there's, there are no side effects involved. Now, in the real world, you might be doing a lot of input and output, so the things change in that, that case. So let, let's, let's look at the similar example, but in this case, we should say assigned, instead of one to three, we should say this expression is going to have the value print line, which is of type unit. And then we create the same tuple, so unit and unit, and then we perform substitution again. Whenever we see expression, we just replace by its bound value. And now we compare the meaning of the two programs, and now the meaning has changed. The first program will print line hey only once, whereas the second one will print line twice. So this is not referential and transparent. It's, it's, it's not pure. And this is when you're working with side effects. You want to control the side effects. You don't want to, you don't want to like, be in a scenarios like this, because you can't perform substitution. You can't do it like in any safe refactor. Because you're changing the meaning of your program. You don't want to be in that position. And this is just a really small example, but when you take this to like a big application in, in, in the real life, like things get really messy, hard to maintain. But <coughs> for example, we can say, okay, how can we make this pure? Because we like we need to access the database, we need to hit the network, we need to interact with input and output. So we would like to still be on the pure functional land, but we have to, you know. We, we need to get paid, and <laughs> if we never run our programs in interacting with the real world, uh, we probably we will get fired very soon. <laughs> so, how about using future? Like, I'm pretty sure like everybody knows uh, uh, Scala concurrent future, um, and future is great for doing asynchronous programming. Like, it, it fires off. It's great for parallelism, but the problem is not good for dealing with side effects. If you just like write a side effect in future. The behavior we're gonna have, have it's the same as like just dealing with side effects straight away, except the thing's gonna be executed in different uh, ex in execution context. So, future doesn't allow us to work with functional programming. The, the the meaning of these two programs are different. The first one prints line hey once, and the second one <coughs> prints line hey twice. Now, how about cuts effect IO? Uh, are these two programs the same? And so we perform substitution again. We replace this expression by its bound value. And, and, and now the meaning of the program is the same. And why is the same? It's still the same because IO represents the intention to perform a side effect. But it's just a pure value. It doesn't execute anything. So it can be composed. You can compose different small pieces of a program into bigger programs. And it gives you local reasoning. You can reason about the small piece of program and by understanding the small programs, you can understand the whole. And that's a very powerful property, which is called referential transparency. Don't forget this term. Um, <coughs> so I think it's, this is really important to have the base to have a, a good understanding of this. If you, if you start breaking referential transparency, you can no longer refactor your code like without being afraid of like breaking it all apart. So I think this is the base, and these are the fundamentals that everybody should know and should have clear. And we should like remind ourselves like every time, why are we doing functional programming? What are the base? What is the base of functional programming? It's referential transparency. So now that I talked about the base, like any questions so far? All right. I'm gonna continue with like no, I'm gonna continue with some examples and then showing how we can compose programs using I.O and also how we can refactor this and test our programs. Um, so before I start, uh, I'm using a few other libraries uh, apart from Cuts Effect. <coughs> and, uh, Cuts Bar, which is like some small syntax for the parallel type class, and Better Monadic 4, which is a compiler plugin. So uh, <coughs> uh, you're going to see some code that probably has some weird syntax, especially the compiler plugin. But I'm just, it's like a great plugin. Uh, everybody should use it. It's like the default for me in any new project, like Kind Projector and Better Monadic 4. So <coughs> let's look at this example. Just gonna drink some. We have this program that I, like, it's just a simple, basic program. Interacts with the input and output, the standard console. Uh, it asks you to enter your name, reads a value from the console, and prints out hello and the, the given input. And our program is pure. It's a, it's, it has a value of type IO of units. It's pure. We can compose this program into larger programs, and, and, and it was, will still be pure in purely functional programming. Right? So this is a possible interaction. 
Well, one thing that I've been noticing, because Cuts Effect is an uh, 1.0, the latest version. Actually, we have a new milestone that is binary compatible. And <coughs> many people that don't have the, 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 the complete picture, the full understanding of Cuts Effect, that you have like an imperative programming code, and you say, hola, r let's wrap everything in I.O., and we've been doing functional programming. Yeah, it's pure. But no, like, it doesn't end there. Like, there's much more to it. Like, Cuts Effect provides a hierarchy of type classes that you can use uh, to abstract over the effect type. Um, and like the, you should ask yourself, how do you test this program? The only thing you get is just IO of units, right? The only thing you can do with that is just like run it, call unsafe run sync to like evaluate the effects. So we are mixing the logic of our program with the interpretation. So we would like to like, write our logic in a separate, separate way. So what we can, one way we can do it, and it's like my preferred way, it's like introducing a tagless final algebra. Tagless final is like probably a fancy concept, but it's just this, it's just a trait with a higher kind of parameter, like an F here. And we will just limit our algebra, our interface, to the functionality we want to expose. Like, what do we want to expose? We just want to write to the console, and we want to read from the console. We don't know what that console is. It's just an interface. And then we write our logic in a separate way. So this, our program here, has a higher kind of parameter as well. And we have a type class constraint, which is a monad. We need monad here because we need to use a flat map, a map. That's a syntactic sugar uh, for, for comprehensions. And, and we need a, an implicit console of f as well. We don't know what the implementation of console is. And we don't care. We just care about our logic to get it right. And this is a super powerful concept. And then you can, you can write code like this, and it's super powerful, and you're going to find that soon why. Like, we have an interface, we have our logic here, it's all separated. We don't know how to run this thing yet. So one thing we can do, like, we have to provide interpreters for our algebra. And we can write on a standard console interpreter, the same we are using the, the cuts effect type classes here, like sync is a, one of the cuts effect type classes that allows you to suspend side effects. And and if that f at the end of the world it's io, then it's the same. Like sync dot delay is the same as io dot apply. But we can also write in a remote console, um, and I'm, I'm using another type class here called async to just to deal with the asynchronous uh, callback based APIs, just as like Scala concurrent future, like in this case, or like some Java callback based APIs. So this is a write abstraction. We don't commit to any any other type. We we just ask. Uh, the least powerful type class that we need to get the job done. And these are two different interpreters. And if you look again at the logic, we don't care what how if this does runs synchronously or asynchronously. We just care about our logic to get it right. And then at the end of the world, what we decide what the interpreter should be depending on the case. Another powerful thing of this is like we can write another interpreter for testing this. And we are, we care only about testing the logic. And one way, um, probably the easiest way to test this will be with the state monad. But in this case, I just wanted to highlight one of the concurrency primitives that Cuts Effect provides as well. It's called ref, and it's just a purely functional atomic reference that it can hold any state in it, and it can manage concurrent state. So it's very powerful. State monad uh, wouldn't work uh, in, in concurrent cases. But for testing, the state monad will do. So we have we created this uh, ref here. We initiated a ref with our initial state, which is a list, uh, an empty list of strings. That's our initial state. We create the console, and we, because we need it implicit, this is syntax of a better monadic for the compiler plugin I talked before. We just invoke our program, and once the program is finished, we just retrieve the state, and we write the assertions that, that in our list, in the internal state, we have the output that we expected. Right? So I think this is super powerful. Like we have one single tagless final algebra, and we have three different interpreters, and you can write as many interpreters as you wish. Like normally, you will have just two, one for production and one for testing. And, and this composes. Like you, can, you can start any writing applications in the large by composing different algebras. Um, so as a recap of what we've seen so far, We've seen a little program just using I.O., but we've seen also that if you think about it, how do you test that program? Like the logic, it's all tight and coupled with the, 
with the interpretation. So we want to want to extract that out only the functionality. So we wrote some tagless final algebras and we wrote an interpreter for using the sync type class, another interpreter using the async type class, and finally we wrote an interpreter for testing our program. So I think this is a very, very powerful concept. And then, and this is the way we use it in production as well, in, in very large applications. And this, like, this, this, is, this is the way, I and mean, this is the way I really enjoy working uh, with Tactless Final. Uh, th so that's cut effect. It's not only I.O., it provides a set of uh, type classes that you can use to abstract over the effect type. And, and it also uses a cut score, you know, whenever you need <coughs> just a functor to do a map, you don't need to require, you know, to have I.O. If you have I.O. there, it's too powerful. You only need to map. You don't need to map pure values, but you need a functor. So this was a really, really small example. So now I want to get into a bit more complex example to show off, like, what, what is possible with cut's effects. And we're going to take more or less the same approach. I have this little program here. It's called Generate Chart. Again, we have an I/O of unit. It's a pure program. Uh, we get the, the bands from a file. It's music bands. Let's say we have music bands in a file. We read them. We get a list of bands, <coughs> and we have two long-running computations that we care only about one of them getting it right. Let's say we have two data centers, and they do a lot of long, long computations, and once one of them was successful, we don't care about the other one. <coughs> so race is one of the one of the primitives that Cat's effect provides, and it will actually erase two computations, and whenever there is a winner, it will just cancel the, the loser. So we want that, that functionality here, uh, that's right. And then we have a, a generate ID method that just gets in a UUID, and then we publish the chart to the radio and TV chart. This is our little program. So let's look how the implementation will look like. Um, for example, we can read, read the bands from the file, and I did it very verbose for a reason. Um, I'm using a, a buffer reader and a file reader, because in real cases, maybe you're dealing with a database or a network connection. You have to deal with resources. You don't want to leak resources. So in this case, <coughs> um, I'm using uh, creating a buffer reader. I'm just flat mapping on that, and then doing the logic, okay, collecting, reading the lines of the file, converting that to a list, and finally to my case class. And what that, that is done, I just emit the value, and I just close the buffer reader. And we, we'll get back to this later, but just like remember this. And the generate ID is a simple function, just wrapping the random UUID in IO. And the two long processes are not doing much, just for the sake of simplicity of this presentation, just simulating time passing using also one of the primitives so of IO, is IO.sleep. This doesn't block a thread, by the way. It's not like a thread leap. Nobody should be using thread.sleep. And <coughs> another implementation, like publishing a radio chart and TV chart, is also, again, a dummy implementation. You can think about it uh, as publishing to a Kafka, a Kafka message broker or to a RabbitMQ or whatever. Like in this case, we just like want to represent that. And yeah, so that's our program, right? Like, it's t again, we have a pure value. Uh, it's an I/O of unit. There, is, there are no side effects going on. But how how do we test this program? How do we make sure that we get the logic right? And this is like a bit more complex already, but it's still simple, right? And let's try to do the same exercise again. So, can we do better? Of course, we learn we can abstract all the functionality on tagless final algebras, right? So let's try to do that again. That, let's go through that exercise. So we, we create this uh, algebras and we just expose whatever we want, like the functionality. And in this case, the only difference is the internal process algebra. It's just um, abstracting over the raising of the two long running computations. So because in the generate chart, we just don't care about that. We just call this process and this guy should take care of that. We don't care if the, there is a raising of two long running computations. We just know that there is something that should be done there. Um, these are the, the algebras, and then um, we will rewrite the program again. Instead, instead of using I/O straight away, we will create. In this class, in this case, I just created a, a, a chart class with the higher kind of f constrained by the monad type class, and I receive all my parameters of my components, all the algebras, as a parameter as well. 
And the logic still remains the same. So I'm just, instead of using a method that is written using IO directly, I'm just using these algebras, right? And then we had, again, to write interpreters for these different algebras. So these are dummy interpreters, like uh, publishing to the radio and TV chart, it just like prints line, but in this case, abstracting over the effect type, we have an F, and again, you see that we are using the sync type class here, that allows us to suspend uh, side effects. Uh, same with the, the ID generation, just wrapping, suspending the side effects of creating a random UUID. And the interesting one is like, again, our data source interpreter, we want to read and the previous interpretation, if you remember, it was just like wrapped in IO, it's just using a flat map and then calling close at the end. But if there was any any failures in, in between reading reading the file, reading the, the lines of the file, if we had any exception there going on, then we would leak resources in the previous implementation. Because we, we, were, we were not using, a, in this case I'm using bracket, which is one of the res, uh, safety resource management that uh, Cuts Effect provides, one of the primitives, and it consists of three different parts. It consists of the acquisition of the resource. In this case, I just like create the acquire value. We are acquiring a buffer reader. Then there is a bracket part where we use it. We use the resource and we have our logic there. And finally, the last part is the release of the resource. So if there's any failures here, like we are reading the lines and like mapping these to, to a list or whatever, any logic there is there that can fail, uh, bracket guarantees that it's not gonna leak any resources. The, you can think about it like the try finally, if there is any error, the finally block will al always execute. So that's the case with brackets. And whenever you find a case where you have to like manage um, nested resources, so with bracket, it will get a bit messy, like the syntax, because you have to write another, if you have to acquire another resource here, you have to do it inside the use block here. And then it, it, you're gonna have a lot of nested calls of brackets, so that's very verbose. So there is another another data type called resource in cuts effect as well, so you can compose, you can just flat map that. Uh, but I'm not gonna show it today. Um, and yeah, we can have another interpreter as well, like a DB database data source. Uh, uh, MySQL, Cassandra, whatever. In this case, I just like returning a pure value. But the idea is to illustrate that we can write different interpreters for, for that algebra. Uh, <coughs> and finally, the internal process where we are abstracting over raising these two long running computations. And see how instead of using io.raise, I'm using f.raise, because I have a, an implicit uh, concurrent. Concurrent is another type class provided by Cuts Effect. It's like uh, async, but with cancellation capabilities. Uh, you have cancellation and you have raise, start, which you can fork a different fiber. And timer, which is a, um, is a data type um, that you can use just to simulate you know, sleep. Instead of using IO sleep, we just use the data type, so we don't really need to use IO straight away. So that's one simple example. We can probably abstract this even more and then you know, create different algebras for this logic. But, and then at the end, we just like compose all together. We have uh, our, our values of our algebras, and we say, okay, this algebra is gonna, it's gonna be bound to this interpreter. And, and then we call, we create our chart, passing the, as, uh, the parameters that, that needs. And we just call the generate method, an unsafe run sync. It's just one of the, as, as, this, as the name sounds, it's an unsafe. You, you should never see this, this in your application. Like, there is something called IO app provided by Cuts Effect as well that you should use and it's recommended. Um, that you you have to deal only with composing your values, your your programs. You never should call this one. But if you see it in, in your code base more than once, you should be worried. <laughs> but if this is just like if if you don't want to use uh, IO app, you can just like call this or unsafe run async and unsafe to future, um, and it should be only at the edge of the world, at the at the end of the world. Uh, which is the main the main uh, method in Java and in Scala. So that's it, right? We have we have our program with algebras. We wrote our different interpreters. We compose our programs, and and we are yeah it's like such an achievement, right? We are really happy with this. But then probably we know the that the business owner comes up and say, oh, we don't really need to wait for these two long running computations to finish in order to publish the chart to the TV and radio chart. So we can probably like 
just fire off this one, fire and forget. And then just continue processing instead of waiting there for that internal process to finish. And we are also told that the radio chart and TV chart, they are very independent from each other, so we can probably run them in parallel to optimize. So can we do better? Well, we, if we know that that's the business requirement, we can do better. And <coughs> notice how like the constraint was monad here, and now I change the constraints. And I have concurrent and par. Par is a parallel from cat score. And so I'm firing and forget this internal process by calling start. Dot start comes is syntax from the concurrent type class, and it just forks the process on a different fiber. Fiber is just a lightweight thread on the JVM that is also an abstraction of cat's effect. So you can think about it as a lightweight thread. Right? You can you can sp spawn many fibers as many as you want, <coughs> and it's very lightweight. And then finally, we are uh, publishing the radio and TV charts in parallel by using partuple. Partuple will just take a tuple and processing them in parallel. There are many many other methods like par sequence, par traverse, uh, par map n. I if you see whatever like any method that start with par it will more likely require a parallel type class in, in scope, a parallel type uh, instance. And, and we finally discard the value by calling dot void. It's like a while, it just like returns unit. And that's amazing, right? Like we did this, this job and, <coughs> and, and I could continue, right, going on because we can discover, like the idea is to understand how we can write different algebras and see the benefit of doing this, that you can test your programs, you can just separate the logic from your interpretation and, and and you have like very reliable code, very maintainable code. Like some newcomers come to this code, and they they can just refactor code from day one. They know they they, they won't break the system just by uh, changing a file for a def, right? So that's I think that's very powerful. If you if you if you have new shiners in your company and you have to to mentor you know new new developers, it's it's like I think this is super powerful to teach like these concepts. And if you probably don't know more about the business requirements, you can go on, you can always come back, say, oh, I think I can abstract this even more, write the different algebras. Uh, so there's always much more to this. But for us, this is going to be the end. Um, so as a recap of what we've seen, uh, we've seen that we can use, uh, we have safe, safe resource management by using the, the bracket primitive, the bracket type class provided by Cuts Effect. We've seen some concurrency using a race and start. Uh, we've seen some parallelism using in the last slide using part tuple. And we've seen some implicit cancellation. I didn't talk about cancellation because that will require a whole new talk. It's, 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 really, it's really hard to grasp cancellation in cuts effect. It's not, it's not that easy. And it took me a while to figure that out. So. Um, but uh, as, a, as a note, like if you're using race, I mentioned that you have you're raising two computations, so you, you will only have one winner. What happens with the loser? The loser will be, will be cancelled. That's all that's going to happen. But that's the implicit cancellation. It's what happens in underneath when, on the implementation of race. And it's the same with part tuple, if you, or part sequence, or any of the part methods. If you have a lot of methods running in parallel, one of them fails, then the other computations will be cancelled. So you have to be aware of this functionality because sometimes you might have unexpected behavior because you, you were not aware of this. Um, uh, I don't know how much time do you have? Okay. Uh, all right. I have this, this, this was the, the end of the examples. Um, what I want to talk about, well, not, not the end, not quite. All right. Uh, we didn't really, th really didn't talk about error handling, right? So what about error handling? Like what, what, what happens if there is any failure in any of our programs? We, we all need to deal with error handling. And, and that, that completely depends on what's, what you want to achieve. Um, if you want to, sometimes you just don't care about failure and you only want to lock the failures, right? So we can use these uh, methods provided by the applicative error type class. Uh, it's called attempt and handle error with. These are like two of the most common, but there are, there are many more. And for example, we just like call our charge generate program, and we call attempt on it, that is going to give us back an F of either of failure or the error type and, and uh, all of the possible value. So we flat map on it, or we, we either get a right or a left. So a right will be unit, so we don't care about value.
But if it's just left with the error, we just log that. Say, all right, like it failed, but we don't care. We just want to log that just to report it in the logs. We see it in Kibana or whatever. But you might want to do some retrying, right? Like you, you might, let's say, you, you might want to retry it like a max number of times, and then I if it fails continuously, then you just want to give up. So you can do the same too as well. You can combine these primitives, uh, the handle error width in this case, and you can use the, in this case, I, I wrote the logic using IO just to be more concise. But again, you can abstract this over defect type. You can use the timer data type to do a slip. But this, this will actually, in case of errors, it will log the message here, and then it will look at the max number of retries. If it's greater than zero, then we will sleep for five seconds. So it's always like a fixed rate. And then it will go back to the execute this resilience. It's a recursive function. Uh, this little thing here is just like a flat map, but ignoring the input. Um, and otherwise, it's, you know, we just give up. Like if the number of retries uh, is equals to zero, we just like say, so okay, the, the program failed after many retries. So we, but this is super powerful. And and maybe if you have more complex logic of retrying. Uh, you, you can still compose a logic, you can, write, you can write it yourself, maybe like an exponential retry as well, that's very easy to write. But if, you're, if your logic of retrying is more complex, there is a library called cat's retry that you might want to want look into it. And it uses, it's inspired by the, the Haskell retry packages, and it uses retry policies, and it combines all these retry policies using the monoids. It's very interesting, like if you, if you retry logic is more complex, probably want to use that instead, writing all yourself. But as an exercise, it's very interesting. You can write that yourself. <coughs> so that was the end of all these examples. So I want to talk about the technical challenges we had at Payde and how using all leveraging the, the power of, of CATS effect, we could, like, for example, we were looking for this, uh, the, for a, a lightweight cache and an in-memory cache. And, uh, like first thing you do is like look on the internet to see if there's any implementation you could use. Uh, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I looked into the alternatives, but I was not really convinced. We just needed something very simple. So I said, what, what if I just try to write it? And, and I, that's what I did. And I um, defined a tackless tack final algebra again. It's like an interface, a cache, with two simple methods, get and put. And the implementation, and this also supports uh, automatic key expirations. And, it, and the implementation fits in two slides. Um, I'm going to share the source code with you anyway, if you're interested in looking into it. But pay attention here how I make the implementation private. I don't want any of the users to, to create this one. And there's a good reason for that. It's like more related to sharing state uh, and in a pure way, or like, like, like creating sharing regions. There is a good talk by Fabio Lavella on that. Um, so. I, I'm not gonna go into details too much. Like, if you if you wanna hack on it, like, but the, the most interesting part is is this. It's like how I expose the logic to the user. Like, how how I get uh, how I give the the option to the user to create a cache, and and this cache will do. Like, the, I'm not gonna look into all the details, but the last part is the most interesting. So we receive this expires in that it will set the expiration of every key by a by a duration and how often do we want to check on the expiration, like in the background? And the most important thing is this one here. We start creating a ref. Remember the ref, this is concurrent primitive from Katz effect. It's just a purely functional atomic reference. So we use this ref to hold the internal state of our cache. And we do this little thing called flat tap. It's similar to flat map. But what it does, it just like receives the input and then it doesn't care about the output. It just passes again the same input. So it's, it's very useful to to, to do the same as flat map, but just like uh, performing some effects and then don't care about the input, just continue with the other input. Um, so what we do here is that we create an empty state using a map for the key and values. Um, and we just uh, fire and forget the, the expiration process check. We remember start was this one that creates a new fiber and then forks the process. And we, we discard the output. We don't care about the output, just we just void for that. And finally, we just create a new ref cache with the internal state. So what this is going to do is whenever you're going to use this, uh, this cache, you, you're just going to start it uh, at, the, at the beginning of your program. And 
you're going to flat map on it just to pass it to, to, to whoever needs the cache. And that's when the expiration process is going to start uh, processing. So I think that was a really in interesting exercise. Like I went through different implementations before getting to the, the last one. I have my colleague Paul there. He did the, the, uh, a review on the pull request and uh, criticized my implementation many times <laughs> until I got it right. And I think I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, I wrote, uh, I ran a lot of ben benchmarks and did a lot of shavy and profiling on this just to, to see how it performed. And I, I think it was like very, very lightweight. So it's, it's pretty safe. It's very performant. So pretty happy with that. So that was one of the things. We have a more complex use case. So what we do at work, we, we are a payment platform. So we have to process payments. A user goes to an online merchant. They select the goods and they just, you know, go to the checkout face and and then they select the payment method and they can say oh i want to pay with payd like just that's the payment method and then they want to get a response back immediately you know like the user doesn't have patience and like we are in 2018 almost 2019 we don't want to wait like too much so the com the, the process we have in, in the back end is quite complex we have to basically we have to decide whether we granted credit to the user or not and we have to do it in real time with the information we get from upstream so basically, this is uh, the, the use case. We have to authorize payments as quick as possible. And for every payment authorization, we need to run several assessments. And this assessment could be an external web service as well, like a, a credit information server of the user or whatever. Um, each of the assessments needs to generate a report and persist it to uh, our database, which is Cassandra. And in some cases, uh, many, of, many of these assessments are independent of each other, meaning that we can run all of them in parallel, right? And of course, we want, we want to be resilient to failures. So like if, if you think about, OK, many assessments can be run in parallel, we can use this parallel or par sequence or par traverse to fire all of them in parallel. And so let's look at a simple example here. Let's, let's pretend that this. IOA, IOB, and IOC are just computations of like these payment assessments. So we are simulating time passing here by using a slip. And in this case, all the computations are successful. IOB, IOA, IOC. So what we could do here is like using a list of all these computations, and we just do a part traverse uh, or a part sequence, and, and this will pull this as successful. But we created this, this little method called per fail fast, which in this case, it does the same. It's very equivalent just to just use par sequence, or in this case, actually par traverse and attempting on the IO computation. That's what we get an either at the end. So if you see the logs, we start the three computations in parallel. After one second, IOA is done. After three seconds, IOC is done. After five seconds, IOB is done. And then we finally get the result back. That, so this is great, this is amazing, so we authorize the payment here. Of course, it doesn't take as much as five seconds, otherwise we, I, get, I will get fired. <laughs> uh, but like, so the, the, the behavior of the, in this case is it's equivalent to power sequence, so that it doesn't bring anything new to the table. The interesting case is when we have to deal with failures. So we trigger um, a logic failures by, by just raising an error in the context of I.O. And in this case, we have the same. Pretend that these are three different assessments, and IOA fails after one second. Uh, IOC fails after three seconds, and IOB is successful after five seconds. So the behavior we, we, we will expect here is after one second, we know that this assessment failed, so we already know what is the, uh, the response that we should give to the user, right? We should say, no, your payment is rejected, it's like we can't continue. But if you were using I know, attempt and part traverse and sequence, we had to wait until all of the computations are done in order to get back to the user. And that's a waste of time. We want to get back to the user as soon as we know that there is a failure. So after one second here, we want to get back to the user and say, this, this, this is our response, but we don't want to cancel the other computations. And there is a, there is a very important reason why we don't, we don't want to do that. It's because some of these assessments cost us money. So if we, we, we fire, uh, all these processes in parallel, so the request already has been made. If we were using par sequence or par traverse, like this one fails and the others will get canceled. But we already are paying for that service, the other assessment. So we don't want to cancel that. We want to, like these processes still keep running in the background, 
generate the report and persist it to the database so we can reuse it in future iterations. So we wanted that behavior. So and that's why like, we created this uh, little method. Uh, per fail fast is a weird name, but we are really bad at naming. Um, so this is the behavior what we want. We fire all these um, processes in parallel, and after one second, we we get a like the I/O of a, the 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 first computation failed. So we return back to the user already a result here. But you can see that in the log, after two seconds and four seconds, the the other computations are still processing in the background. And in our real case, these are just the uh, assessments generating the report and persisting to the Cassandra. And this is amazing. It's like a really mind-blowing uh, function, and it's like very handy. And, and this is the implementation. It just fits on the screen. Like, again, probably hard to grasp it at, at the beginning, but um, we are using another concurrent primitive provided by Katz effect that is called deferred. Deferred is just a purely functional promise. It could be completed only once. And so we use like a, a few recover with this also from applicative error attempt, and, and we use a rethrow again, which is from monad error or applicative error, can't remember. But see, we are also abstracting our defect type here, so this is like very very generic and it could be reused. So it's like that's amazing. I think this is this is completely mind blowing, and and this is one of the things like. One of the little things that you can do with cat's effects, like if you start playing around and creating like these crazy functions, it, you just get to a point where you can solve really, really, really hard problems in a few lines, right? It might take you the weekend thinking about it, <laughs> playing around, but it's like very fun. It's like very showful to work with, and so that that was the, the implementation there. So, but there's much more. There's much more. We have amazing documentations, like probably the cutest in the in the in the community, thanks to Impure Picks. Um, so yeah, take a look at the documentation. We have an amazing community, very friendly. Um, they're always ready, ready to help you out in the Gitter channels. Uh, I myself am so sometimes there, like kind of always as well, uh, in a Japanese time zone, which sometimes <laughs> uh, and the ecosystem is amazing as well. Like uh, one of the greatest libraries are we use at work as well, FS2 and HTTP4S. But there are many, many other projects. So. I'm going to be sharing the slides and the source code or, or all what you've seen so far so you can play yourself with it. I haven't pushed it yet, but I'm going to share it on, on my Twitter. Uh, but this is, this is where you're going you're gonna to find it anyway. So that's all I have. If you have any questions. Hi, thank you. Um, in the beginning, I see that you use the IO monad to wrap uh, the um, the effect of the, the side console, effects. and uh, you use also the tailless final to abstract the, uh, the 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 monad f. Yep. And uh, the reason you do that is to uh, test uh, to e to make it easy to test. But if in the program we just use one IO monad, and even in the test we use the IO monad, maybe we don't need it. Well, the reason is not only to test it. Mm. I think the reason is because you want to separate the logic from the interpretation. If you have a single program, like in the real projects, you will have like more complex logic. And how do you make sure that is that is real, really doing what you expect, mm. right? Mm. And the only way is just to abstract. Like if you, like Tackless Final allows you to do that. You just define an interface. And and then you you can write different interpreters, but the main the main reason you do that is just to separate the logic from the interpretation. So that's very powerful also as well because you are constraining your your programs your you, by for example whenever you need just to flat map a map <coughs> you just say I only need the monad here mm -hmm. I don't care if at the end that that becomes I/O that it most cases do but you are constraining the program you are giving. This is called the principle of uh, least power. You just use like whatever you need, like to get the shop done. Not much more than that. And IO, IO is too powerful. IO, like you could do many, many other things. That you can mess up. Like so, it's better to abstract over the effect type and give it the right constraint, the the least that you need. Yeah. Uh, second question is: uh, Did you consider using the free monad instead of the tailless final? No. I use it in the past, yeah, but uh, it's more heavyweight. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with a lot of co-products that's very heavy to compile. 
there are there are a few trades off as well that you can inspect all the data structures of a free monad. But I think we are in 2018. I think the clear winner is Tagless Final. So the Tagless Final for the win. <laughs> the presentation um, I see in the uh, demo logs that you have uh, I think uh, one uh, thread pool and uh, all the computation may be run into uh, one thread pool do you have the need in production to customize a thread pool in, in order to be more efficient mm -hmm. um, so like we've been talking only about logic and how we we'll separate the logic from the interpreters we didn't didn't really talk about com execution context or what is this threat is running this thing on. So like you shouldn't really care about that un unless you have a very specific need. And for example, one very good case is uh, whenever you're using any access to a database that is blocking IO, you want to run that in a different execution context. And it's a very, there is a very good data type, an abstraction by Katz effect that is called context shift. And context shift has this single method that is called eval on, and it, and it receives an execution context. So basically, what you do is like you have all your computations, and you say shift eval this piece, like this access to the database on this blocking execution context, and then shift back to the to the main execution context. Like in past versions, you had to do that yourself. You didn't using this shift, and then executing on the, uh, on, on the blocking execution context and then shift back. Now that is automatic. Like it, it's provided by this abstraction called context shift. Um, so in the same way we, we, are, we were constraining our, uh, well in this case no, but like let's say we have timer here. You, you could have like just a requirement to have context shift in that method. And then context shift allows you to, to, to do this eval on and different thread pool. And it will shift back to the main execution context automatically. So that's it. <laughs> uh, hi, congratulations for the great talk. Thanks. Um, have you ever leveraged this cool stuff in distributed and stateless environment context like Spark, uh, where, I mean, the fact that you just leverage lambdas may or may not actually take advantage of this stuff? Uh, not really. Like, so that's one of one of the things that you like. It, this kind of like we, uh, cuts effect or Scala ZIO, I.O., uh, it doesn't support distributed computations, right? So you have to look at different solutions. Whenever I had to, to do like very, uh, a lot of like processing in distributed, normally use a, a message broker like Kafka or RabbitMQ, and normally I will use FS2 for control flow, all of this stuff. And FS2 is like a, a bit more powerful for that kind of uh, scenario, so it, and it also uses cuts effects. So that, that will be probably like, the, the tool that I would use. Uh, but we do use Spark at work. Uh, my, I myself, I'm not working on that, so <laughs> I don't know. But if I get, I get assigned to work on this project, uh, I, I don't know, I will try to figure it out, like, just how to make it pure. <laughs> yeah. Did you open source the uh, cache uh, implementation you made, or is it? Oh, uh, it's gonna be here. Th it's in there. It's it's all in there. It's more. Yeah, nice. like the slides and the code is gonna be there. Yeah, ah, great. And uh, it's like with the mid license as well, so you can you can just use it, take it, do whatever you want. Thanks for your talk. Thank you. Here. Um, do you use a beta monadic four in production? Yeah. 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 Okay. So Better Monadic 4 is this uh, plugin uh, by Oleg Pishkov. Uh, I think it's, it's a great contribution. And it allows you to, to do, uh, for example, you know, when, whenever you have a tuple in, in, a, in a context, for example, in I.O., and you do a for comprehension, you can't do really assigned, um, like bind two different variables in a tuple on the left side of for comprehension, because Scala will complain that requires this with filter, right? So. Um, the better monadic for what what it does is just rewrites the, the sugar in of the for comprehension to make it simpler and it, it just avoids the extra the extra map call so it's more performant and it also has in the latest version this implicit zero that it allows you to bind an implicit value in a for comprehension yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, I was afraid to use it in production because it rewrites your program. It does, yeah. yeah. So but it's, you, you it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is indeed, but uh, yeah, no. I mean, I, I, I trust Oleg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, <that's> <laughs> thanks. All right, no more questions so far? Uh, all right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we are hiring, so if you are uh, interested <laughs> in, in moving to Tokyo and Japan, like, just <coughs> come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you very much.